Welcome to Bible Adventures at Lookout Point. The railroad comes right through this tunnel here, and I thought this would be a pretty nice place for us to stop and have all of our Bible time. So that's what we're going to be doing here this week, and I'm looking forward to spending more time with you all. My name is Christina, which is what most of the tweens normally call me, but I know some of you I might have had in children's church or when you were younger, and you might be used to calling me Miss Christina, so either is fine. I'm going to be teaching on days one, two, and four, and someone else is going to be teaching on days three and five. That's going to be Sam Beveridge. So some of you might know him also from Children's Church or from other things here at the church. And Sam Beveridge is actually going to be the new tweens director this fall. So I thought it would be a great opportunity for you guys to get to know him a little bit better and for him to teach some of the Bible stories. Oh, and also, I have a couple other people who are going to be helping me this week. And let's meet them right now. Their names are Andrew and Elizabeth. Come on out, guys. So I thought that we could all share a few answers to some questions with each other. And let's get started with what is your name, your grade, and your age. My name is Andrew. I am 12 years old and I am going into 7th grade. I'm Elizabeth, I'm 11 years old and I'm going into 6th grade. Awesome. And first question, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? My favorite flavor of ice cream is cookies and cream. My favorite flavor of ice cream is cookie dough. And mine's cookie dough also, so that's kind of cool. We all have like cookies in common with our ice cream. Oh, toppings. Do you guys put toppings on your ice cream? Not M&Ms normally. sometimes, not but not normally. Sometimes. If I do, sometimes I'll do gummy bears, but... That's awesome. I, I like to put, like, caramel sauce on mine sometimes. Mm. That's really good. All right, next question. Uh, favorite topic to learn about? I like to learn about science and history and photo and video editing. I like to learn about crafts, but especially crocheting and knitting. And what do I like to learn about? I think I'm also on the history train. I like to watch Discovery Channel and History Channel and learn about like all different kinds of history, everything way back. All right, if you could travel, oh, so related to history. If you could travel to any time, when would it be? So I would go to the time of World War II and in specifics, I would not be in, I would be in the US. So, is there anything you'd like to see from World War II? Uh, the planes. Ooh, the planes. That's cool. Um, a place where I would like to travel in history would be ancient history, especially when they found out how to spin yarn, or basically anything. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Let's see, when would I like to, oh, that's right, okay, so, um, you know, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, and when he invented the light bulb, he had this plan that like, like the mayor or something of the town, I don't remember the exact details, had asked him, can you like on New Year's Eve light up the entire like town square with, with light bulbs? And he, he invented the light bulb just in time and he turned on the switch and all of the light like turned on and I think it would have been so cool to be there uh, when people first saw electricity because like, you know, to us we're like, oh, we just flip a switch, the lights turn on, you know, but to them it would have been the first time. So I think, I think that would be pretty cool. All right, and what do you want to be when you grow up? I would like to be a fighter pilot in the U.S. Air Force. And I would like to be an orthodontist. And for those of you who don't know, I actually didn't say this right here, but another favorite topic that I love to learn about is tornadoes. 
And if I did not have the job that I have right now, I would want to be a storm chaser. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I want to I wanna chase tornadoes. <laughs> uh, okay, um, two more questions. Uh, one, what are some things that you are good at? I'm, I'm, oh, you can go. <laughs> I'm pretty good at basically all crafts, but crocheting is my specialty, basically. <laughs> and you've made a lot of things yeah, crocheting, I have, right? Yeah, I've made a lot. Um, I like to make small things, so I make little hair clips sometimes that I like to wear a lot. That's awesome. <laughs> and I like to do photo and video editing, as previously mentioned. I do all the photography and videography for the YouTube channel that my sister uh, does. Um, I also like running and sports, uh, physical activity. So. What are some things I'm good at? I'm good at math and I'm good at building things. All right, and the very last one, what are some things that are hard for you? Um, something that's hard for me is writing. Why, is there any like specific reason? Um, probably that? because it's hard for me to get my thoughts on paper. But I'm sure you have like lots of ideas, Yeah, right? I have yeah. Lots, <laughs> lots of ideas, ideas and then can't get them on paper. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, anything that's hard for you? Um. Writing, math, and focusing. Writing, math, and focusing. You know, what's funny is I was actually going to say something that's hard for me is running. I don't know why. Even when I tried to do lots of running to get better at it, I just kind of hit a plateau and then I don't get any better. So it's kind of funny because you said you were good at writing and that it's hard for me. But then I said that I'm good at math and you said it was hard for you. So that's kind of cool that we all have our different yeah. you know, strengths and um, things that are hard for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, so thanks for sharing and I think this morning we also asked these same questions to a lot of you guys if you were joining us on the live the live stream so like I mentioned these last two questions we're going to be talking about them in our story today there are things that all of us have that we're good at but there's also things that are hard for us and like we saw with each of us it can be different for each one of us right Sometimes there are things that seem too hard, though, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about how Jesus's power helps us to do hard things, which is awesome because some of the time a job might seem too big for us to handle or too complicated or maybe even too scary to try. And I've actually asked Andrew and Elizabeth to help me out with something else today. They're going to help me to share the Bible story by performing a skit. So how about you guys go get ready? Um, and I'm going to give a little bit of background to everybody who's watching before we do that. Can you guys yeah, grab the stools? Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go grab a stand to put all my papers on, and I'll be right back. So. In today's story, we're going to hear about someone who had to do something really hard and really scary. This story is from the book of Acts, which happens just after the life of Jesus. The book of Acts is all about the early church forming. Jesus' friends were telling everyone they could about the amazing story of Jesus saving us. We'll talk about that story on day four, but for now, know that there were some people who were excited and happy to hear the good news, and then there were some other people who were not so happy to hear about it. In fact, there were some people who hated Christians talking about Jesus so much that they would put them into prison or even kill them. A man named Saul was one of these people. In chapter 7 of the book of Acts, we learn about a Christian named Stephen who was trying to share the good news of Jesus. People got so angry that they killed him on the spot, and Saul was there watching the whole time. Chapter 8 goes on to say, Saul was one of the witnesses, and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. A great wave of persecution began that day sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. 
some devout men came and buried Stephen with great sadness. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. Saul continued to throw Christians into jail and even kill Christians. People who followed Jesus all over the region were terrified of Saul. Terrified that Saul would come and find them and put them into jail or worse, kill them. But then... Jesus did something amazing in Saul's life. So I want you guys to go grab your Bible, if you don't have it with you, um, so you can just put this video on pause and go get it. And if you do not have a Bible, you can let me know. My email address is on the Park Street Church website, so you can just send me an email and I will make sure that you get a Bible. Okay, so if you have your Bible, we're going to turn to Acts chapter 9. And let's just talk really quickly about how to find something in the Bible, just in case you don't know. So, Bible. There are many books in the Bible. And the way that you find the book of Acts is first you want to go to the table of contents. Um, so there's many books that you might have at school that have a table of contents. And this is kind of similar. And this just helps you to find things in the Bible. So we are looking at the New Testament. And the New Testament is all about Jesus' life and then what happened after Jesus, like what we're talking about right now in the book of Acts. So there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. And then you follow that across. And in my Bible, the book of Acts starts on page 1077. So I'm going to turn to page 1077. One thousand seventy-five and one thousand seventy-seven. Perfect. And we are doing Acts chapter nine, verses one and two. So to find the chapter, you are going to look for the big numbers. At the very beginning, you'll see a big number one. For me, I have to turn the page to find the big number two, big number three, and we're going to keep going until we find the big number nine. So we are in chapter nine. There's eight. Did I go past it? Oh, no, I'm just not there yet. Here it is. Okay. Big number nine. And we're doing verse one. So that's just the very beginning. All right. So I'm going to read verses one and two. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, which is what they called Christians back then, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So basically, Saul is going to Damascus just so that he can find more Christians to take them and bring them back to Jerusalem and put them into jail. All right, and let's continue on with Acts um, chapter 9, verse 3, and we're going to read 3 through 9. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm going to pause here for just one second to explain this. So Saul was a Jew. So Saul did believe in God. He just didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior of the world. So that's why he's there and he's like, oh, God's talking to me. Like, what's going on? So I just want to point that out. All right. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there, speechless. They heard the sound, the voice, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. 
So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days Saul was blind and did not eat or drink anything. So now Saul is in Damascus. He was going there to find more Christians to throw into jail. But along the way, his life was changed by Jesus. Changed in many ways, including the problem that he's now blind. So God gave a vision to someone else living in Damascus. This person was Ananias. And God told Ananias to go to Straight Street to find Saul, place his hands on Saul, and pray for his eyes to be healed. And now, Andrew and Elizabeth are going to show us what it must have felt like to be Ananias in this exact moment. Ah! Who is it? Oh, it's you, Ananias. What are you doing? I am hiding. What does it look like? Hiding from who? Everyone! Well, that's not going to work. There are people watching us right now. Oh, hello everyone. This is my friend Ananias, who apparently is hiding from everyone. Who exactly are you hiding from? I'm hiding from Saul. He's here in Damascus. He's arresting people who love Jesus, and I, I love Jesus! So, I guess you... He's arresting everyone who loves Jesus. So, I guess you haven't heard that... Yes, Saul was on the road to Damascus when he was blinded by a great light who sh it was shown around him. And he saw Jesus and heard his voice, and he was thrown to the ground, and he was blind, and his buddies took him to Damascus right here. Oh, yeah, I heard all that. So why are you hiding, and why are you wearing that silly mustache? It's a disguise. Ow! Now you've ruined my cover. Trust me, it wasn't working. Well, God came to me in a vision and told me to go to Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Wow. And I was supposed to put my hands on him and pray over him, and then he'll see. So why are you here instead of where God told you to be? Because when Saul can see, guess what he's going to see? Me. Someone who loves Jesus. And Saul arrests people who like Jesus. And he throws rocks at people who like Jesus. And uh, I'm not exactly what he's going to do with that. But I don't want to know. I'm not sure if I can do this. Why has God put me in such a hard place like this? God asks people to do hard things all the time. Like when he told Moses to go to Pharaoh to let the people go. Or when he had Esther talk to the king to save all the Israelites. Or when he had Nehemiah. Okay, okay, I get it. Okay. But this is a really hard thing. This is like a super hard thing. Like I am risking my whole life to do this hard thing. Thing. I'm scared. I'm not sure if I can do it. And end scene. So earlier we talked about some things that are hard for us to do, like maybe a front handspring in gymnastics, or maybe there's a subject in school that's pretty tough for you. But I'm wondering if there's something hard happening in your life right now. Maybe you're worried about heading to a new school this fall. Or maybe you said something mean to a friend and you're afraid to go talk to them about it. So what does it really feel like to put your trust in someone when they ask you to do something that's hard? To demonstrate this, I'm going to ask Elizabeth to come back out, and we're going to show you. Come on out, Elizabeth. All right, so Elizabeth can see uh, behind on the stand here. And you want to tell them what you see on the stand here? Mouse traps. Mouse traps. Have you ever used a mouse trap before? Uh, all I know is that they're in our basement, but other than that, no. <laughs> all right, let me show Elizabeth how a mouse trap works. Now, I'm not going to fully uh, set it up right now, but um, well, actually, how about, okay. So if you, if you hold on to this, you can, can just feel, here, I'll let you hold on to this, but don't let it slip. Be really careful. Feel how tight that spring is. Oh, yeah. That's really tight, right? Yeah. Okay. Let it, good. Okay, good. So what happens is 
this gets pulled all the way back and then you like do a thing where you set but it's like it's mm -hmm. stuck yeah. in right now so we're not going to you set this up and then when the mouse comes it triggers this and ah. so uh how much do you think it would hurt if you got your finger caught in there a lot <laughs> yeah okay all right mouse trap one Oh, look at mouse trap two. More. <laughs> so as you can see, <laughs> we have that was a lot louder than the other two. So probably <laughs> more, more than the other two. All right, so Elizabeth, I'm gonna ask you to trust me. Do you think you can do that? Mm-hmm. What I want you to do is I want you to put your fingers right here. Okay. And I'm going to let go of the mousetrap. And it's not going to hurt you. Do you believe that? Yes. Really? Yes. You really truly believe this? Yes. Okay. On the count of three. One, two. <laughs> oh! <laughs> wow! Elizabeth really <laughs> trusts me, doesn't she? Okay, ready? We're going to try it again. One, two. <laughs> so um, let's look at what's different about these two. So with this mouse trap, here I'll turn them. Wait, which way is which? This way. Okay. So with this mouse trap, the reason why the spring like actually works mm -hmm. is because so there's the spring part, but you see yeah. this end part how it curls oh. around there. So when I pull it back, that spring part is putting a lot of tension on it. Oh. And that's what makes it. So that's what makes it snap. Right, exactly. But then but this with, one is not. But done. with this one, I kind of secretly oh. took off this little piece right here <laughs> so that it doesn't actually, doesn't actually do anything. Wow, I was really <laughs> impressed with how much Elizabeth trusted me. Um, if any of you that's guys, cool. I know, right? Yeah, I, I, that's, I never <laughs> knew that. So let me, let me tell you a quick story. So I found this idea online and when I was watching it online and the grown up asked this girl to put their hand there and to trust, you know, the person who was holding mm -hmm. it back, I started sweating. Like my hand started getting, I was so scared. I was so scared that it was actually going to hurt the little girl when she was like, yeah. and she was like, I mean, you're 11, right? Yeah. But this little girl was only like six or something. And she put her hand on it and she was like, when she did it, she was so scared. But wow, I was really impressed that you were just like, I trust you because I feel like if it was the other way around, if anybody was doing it to me, I would stick my hand on there and go, okay, okay. And then they would have, you know, like, sh like how I shook yeah. it, you know? I would have, I would have gone like that because I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to trust, which is really funny. Um, so in this circumstance, you had complete trust in me right mm -hmm. but let's just say that i don't know maybe it was somebody else that you didn't know as well or i don't know maybe, maybe there just something else happened where you would like be a little bit more scared would you have had a hundred percent trust in that person probably not right and that's because you didn't know like how it was gonna work. Yeah. Now you see how it how yeah. it works. And so now if I'm like, it's so like, well maybe it maybe and maybe when you put your hand on there, like mm -hmm. you felt really confident, but maybe there was like a slight thing in the back of your mind that was just like a little bit worried, maybe. Maybe not. Maybe you were like, I trust Christina hundred percent. But um but like imagine right now I'm like, okay, put your hand right there. Do you believe that you're gonna get hurt? No. Well no, I mean yeah, obviously, because I know. <laughs> you know, right? Like you know this yeah. is a uh, like basically a fake mouse trap right now, right? And then is there a way that you could put this back? Yeah, and if you wanted to, yeah. you could like reset it back up. But right now, it's it's just completely <laughs> fine. So some of the time, we might listen to a Bible story, and because we've heard it tons of times, we already know the ending, right? So for example, I don't know. Let's just say, oh, earlier in the skit when you guys were talking mm -hmm. about Esther. And yeah. Esther had to go to the king to save the Israelites. And she was really afraid because she was afraid that the king would get angry at her, maybe even kill her. But we know the end of the story. And what's the end of the story? 
that all the Israelites are saved. That all the Israelites were saved and that Esther was safe. But imagine being in Esther's position, right? <laughs> like you don't know the end of the story. And that's really scary to not know the ending, right? So I think some of the time when we read Bible stories is we can kind of forget that, you know? We forget that the people who are actually in the story, they don't know the ending yet. Um, and, and just like that, in this moment, Ananias knows that Jesus wants him to go pray for a murderer. For a murderer, okay? This guy kills Christians on the spot, or at least takes them to mm -hmm. jail, right? So Ananias is having to trust that he can do this hard thing and that Jesus is going to be with him. Question. Do you think that trusting Jesus, in Ananias' case, having to trust Jesus that he has to go talk to and pray for a murderer and that he could be killed, do you think that is easier or harder than trusting me? With the mousetrap. Probably harder. Probably harder. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Elizabeth. Bye. <laughs> so I think that sometimes by asking us to do hard things, God is helping us learn how to trust him. Each time that we choose to trust God, we grow and our ability to trust him. It's kind of like working out. The more you lift weights and work your muscles, the stronger your muscles get. And it's the same with trusting God. So the more you practice trusting God, the better at it you will get. Before we go today, I wanted to share with you a story about how Jesus's amazing power helped me and some of my friends do something that was hard. So in college, I was a part of an acapella group and we were the only Christian acapella group on campus. It was really cool because I got to use one of my talents, singing, to share Jesus's love with others. Each year during our spring break, we would go on a trip together. We would pick the hometown of someone in our group, we would travel there, and we would stay there for a week. Sometimes we would do special projects, like helping to prepare dinner at a soup kitchen, but our main focus was finding places where we could sing, and not places like a fancy concert hall. We wanted to take our music into places where people were often forgotten, or ignored, or looked down on places where people really needed to hear about the love of Jesus. So my last year in college, we were preparing for our trip, which that year was to the Pennsylvania and New Jersey kind of region. One of the places that we had lined up to sing at was a prison. There were many emails that went back and forth between our acapella group and the people at the prison who worked there and were coordinating this with us. We had to send in pictures of our IDs and get background checked, and we were told what kind of clothes we could wear. We were told what we were allowed to bring into the prison, which was basically only one bottle of water and an ID. And we were given a list of rules that told us what we were and what we were not allowed to say and do while we were in the prison. For example, it said it was okay if you said your first name, but you could not say your last name. With each email we got, it felt like we got more and more scared about going. Is this really the right decision? Is this even safe for us to do? But no matter how we felt, no matter how scared we got, we knew deep down in our hearts that it was the right thing to do. God had given us an opportunity to share his love with others. And while it felt like a really hard and a really scary thing to do, we knew it was the right decision to follow what God wanted us to do. So on the day we got to the prison, we were all a little nervous. We first went through a metal detector and a security check. Then we had to cross from uh, one side of the prison to the other. And there were even some people that were shouting at us from out the windows. Um, and finally, we got to the other side of the prison, 
and the person that we were with brought us into this room to warm up. So we did our warm ups, we sang through a few of our songs, we took turns praying, and then we were ready to go. So the person walked us down this long hallway that had a door at the end. He opened it and we walked in. It was a plain room. It was, it was pretty big, but plain empty room that had a lot of folding chairs that were set up for people to sit in there. The room's capacity was 230 people and the room was overflowing. There were so many people in there that the chairs were being like crammed in right next to each other with no extra space. So we kind of squeezed into what little space there was left and we introduced ourselves and we started singing. As we were singing, something really amazing happened. There were people in the crowd who were shouting, Alleluia, and praise the Lord. With each song that we sang, the applause got louder and louder. People were giving us standing ovations after every single song. And then there was this one guy that was sitting right in front. And when I say right in front, I mean that we were standing right here and there was somebody right there listening to us sing. That's how jam-packed this room was. So this guy right in front, every single time we would finish a song, he would say, one more, just one more. At the end, when we had run out of songs to sing, everyone was standing and applauding and the clapping just kept going and going. Then they ended up forming a line, which was amazing because like I said, this room was so crowded, but they formed this line because they all wanted to shake our hands and personally say thank you to us. And after our whole group had gone down this line, stretching and like wrapping around and shaking hands with people, they wanted to pray for us. They thanked Jesus for bringing us into their prison to sing for them and to share his love. And then they prayed that we would be able to keep singing lots of places all over to share Jesus' love with even more people. When you are about to enter into something hard or scary, know this, Jesus is already there. The Bible tells us that he makes a way for us. He goes before us to make a way. So when we decide to trust Jesus and do something that is hard or scary, we don't walk into whatever it is alone. Jesus has already gone before us to make a way and we are trusting him and we aren't going into it alone. We are following Jesus into it. And because we know that Jesus is all powerful, we know that he can do anything. And because we also know that he is good, we can trust that Jesus will use his power to help us, no matter how big or how scary or how impossible our hard thing is. All right, so that wraps it up for our lesson, but before we go, I wanted to do a bit of prayer together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give us what's called a prayer prompt. So it's just something to kind of think about as we're praying. And today, what I want you to be thinking about is, is there anything that is hard in your life right now Maybe something that feels impossible for you to do or so big you're not sure you can handle it. Or maybe like in my case, maybe it's something scary that your hard thing is. And so I want you to spend this time talking to Jesus about that, telling him about any of your concerns or about your fears or anything that's kind of holding you back from doing this hard thing that you know that you should do. So I'm going to start us off in prayer. I'll leave a little bit of time in the middle where I'm silent that you can spend that time sharing those thoughts with Jesus. And then I will close us up at the very end. Oh, and also when we pray, I wanna make sure you know that what your body looks like on the outside is not the important part. The important part is that your heart and your mind are focused on talking to Jesus. 
So for some people, the way that helps them to focus best is by closing their eyes or by putting their hands together or maybe sitting or kneeling. There's lots of different ways your body can look on the outside, but the most important part is your heart following Jesus, talking to him and listening. All right, so let's pray. Dear Jesus, we want to thank you so much that you are all powerful. Because you are all powerful, that helps us to be brave. We know that you can do anything and we know that you care about us. So we know that you can use your power to help us when we have something hard that we need to do. And Jesus, that gives us courage. So thank you, Jesus, so much that you are all powerful. Thank you that you can do anything and thank you that you love to help us. So Jesus, right now we are talking about doing hard things. And we know there's lots of things that you've called us to do. Like for example, loving our neighbor. That can be really hard. So Jesus, right now we just wanna spend a little bit of time talking to you about something in our life that is a hard thing and asking for your help. Asking for you to give us the strength and the courage in order to do that hard thing. Jesus, thank you so much that you are with us, that you are with us whenever we have to do something hard. And Jesus, thank you that you have already gone before us and that you've gone into that hard situation that we are about to face and that you have already made a way. Thank you, Jesus, for your power and thank you, Jesus, that you use your power for our good and to help us. Amen. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining me today for Bible Adventures at Lookout Point. I'm excited to see you tomorrow for day two. Bye.
right, so let's take a look at all the pieces that you got inside of your box. Uh, we'll work from this way over there. All right, so these two pieces are going to be on the very bottom. You'll notice there's an up and an inside. We'll get to that later. These four pieces are going to be coming together to make the pencil box portion. These pieces in the middle will be making the partitions for the kind of smaller pencil box parts. This is on the bottom where everything rests on top of it. These are on the two sides. Uh, back over here. This is an extra part we'll talk about later. And this is the cow catcher. Over here we have our six wheels. We have 12 washers, 12 big washers, six small washers, and six one and a half inch screws for the wheels. We have six screws for attaching on the base to these bottom runners. We have two screws for attaching the cow catcher onto the base. We have these as decoration for the wheels, if you would like to add them later. We have some rubber bands to help with the gluing process. Speaking of which, we have our glue right here. We have the colors of paint that you selected and the paint brushes, the foam paint brushes. We have a couple of Sharpies and a white paint marker for writing and decorating also. And then at home, here's a few things that you will need. You'll also need to find something to paint, put your paint inside of. It can be just like a used yogurt cup or a um, piece of cardboard, just something you can put your paint in so that you can use it. Um, you'll need something underneath your work area. So I have these pieces of paper that I'm going to put down. Um, and one more thing, you'll have safety glasses inside of your box and you will need some way to put in all of the screws. Uh, these are all a Phillips number two screw head. I have my power drill. Um, you might have a power drill at home. Um, you might also just have a regular screw. And I think for those of you who needed a screwdriver, we included one in your box. All right, so let's get started painting. Um, let me tell you a few of the different things and where they go. So these four were for the pencil box thing, and then we had our wheels, our side. Okay, so this is what I'm gonna do. I have my four colors here. I think I'll do one color for the pencil box. Let's do blue for that one. I'll do one color for the wheels. Mm, let's do orange for the wheels. Orange for the wheels, I have pink and green left. I want to do pink on the sides. So I'm gonna put my pink next to my two sides. And then I'm gonna do green down the kind of middle portion. So that will be for these four. And then also this guy. So I'll move him over here to include him in that group. And my cow catcher. Hmm, what color do I want this to be? I think we'll do blue also, so we'll keep it over here. All right, so I'm gonna get started painting and I'll be back when I'm all done. So I have all the different pieces painted. It looks really cool. I'm really excited about this. Um, and one thing that I did want to point out that I forgot to mention earlier is what your wood looks like. So if you'll notice, mine looks a little bit different than yours. And maybe I should grab, does this kind of show a little bit of a better example? Oh, they're about the same. Um, so 
in order to make this, this is actually a prototype that I made. And what I did is I used a machine called a Cricut that kind of cuts things out and it can cut out wood, but it can only cut out wood up to three 30 seconds of an inch. So in order to make three sixteenths of an inch, which is how thick your pieces are, I had to cut out all the pieces twice. I had to clamp and glue them all together. I had to let them dry. I had to sand them. It was this whole big long process. But the pieces that you have inside of your box are actually laser cut. So they were cut out with a laser. Isn't that so cool? So that's why my pieces might look a little bit different. I haven't quite decided, as of right now, I haven't quite decided which wood I want to use for your pieces. So it might be a darker color or it might be the same color. But um, what you have in your box is the correct thing. So I just wanted to let you know that just in case you were wondering while looking at my pieces. Okay, well, we have everything painted, and that wraps us up for part one of Queen's Craft. When we come back next time, we're going to start assembling the train. See you then. My name is Dominic, and I'm almost 11 years old. Dominic lives with his mom, dad, grandma, and grandpa. He enjoys all kinds of hobbies, but one is his favorite. I like to build things. I also like karate a lot. I love karate because I get to really express myself and I get to have fun. And I also get to build character and build physical strength. Learning karate is hard work. Dominic practices up to three times a week. Plus he practices at home with his dad. The hardest thing about karate is definitely a lot of push-ups, leg lifts, sit-ups. Dominic knows that he needs to trust Jesus when things get hard. There was this board breaking thing and I saw all the other kids break it with their palm right here, right here. Boom. Just didn't work out for me. Dominic failed to break the board with his hand, but he didn't give up. He continued to train and he asked Jesus to help him. And I said, I'm going to break this board. It's an obstacle in my way and let me push through it. And ha! I broke it. Another part of karate is taking tests to earn new belts. Each belt color represents a new level. Earning a new belt is hard. I was very discouraged on the first day because I was afraid it wasn't going to pass, and that's what brought me down. The second day, I was feeling very, very discouraged, very, very, very sad. And I thought, I don't think I'm going to pass this, and I didn't failed and I failed and I failed. Finally got to the last day that I could possibly test and I said, this isn't gonna be like those last times. I am going to pass it. I said, you know what, Jesus, Jesus can help me get through this. I'm just gonna pray to him today. I am gonna pass the test tomorrow. And I did. In the Bible, in the book of Philippians, chapter four, verse 13, it says, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. My three-day test, it was really hard. And Jesus helped me through that. I was nervous for it. If you're going through hard things, I suggest that all you need to do is just trust in God and he'll help you. Pray to God and he can get you through anything. Jesus' power helps us do hard things. Everywhere I go on this road, high and low, there I go, I go with you. So I won't be afraid, this my home, come what may.
everybody. Well, I hope you had a great day singing and doing crafts and reading the Bible, and most importantly, learning about how Jesus' power helps us do hard things. Trust Jesus. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Bye!